All right. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the CHIP Frontline Dispatch Seminar. Today, we're going to hear about maternal and infant health data equity and modernization. Are we there yet? From Dr. Wanda Barfield of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm Ken Mandel. I am the director of the Computational Health Informatics Program at Boston Children's Hospital. We host this series. We were founded in 1994. We're a multidisciplinary applied research and education program. You can learn more about us at www.chip.org. The Frontline Dispatch series is an event featuring on the news topics from leaders in informatics, IT, public health, big science, innovation, and more. If you want to follow along um, on social media or tweet, their boss chip is our program handle, and at Mandel is mine. So we're going to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Barfield. She'll give her presentations. This is a webinar format, so you can put your questions into the Zoom Q&A box as we go, and then we'll have some brief closing remarks at the end. Wanda Barfield, um, a longtime friend and colleague, is the director of the Division of Reproductive Health within the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the CDC. She is a retired assistant surgeon general in the US Public Health Service. She joined the CDC in, in 2000 as part of its Epidemic Intelligence Service, where she worked in neonatal and perinatal health. She was named division director in 2010. Her research focuses on maternal infant morbidity and mortality, early child health services utilization, improving access to risk appropriate perinatal care, and advancing the quality of maternal, infant, and reproductive health for public health action. And um, I will show you also um, the Hear Her campaign, a major, very successful national campaign that Dr. Barfield is a leader of um, that is really tackling uh, pregnancy-related uh, complications uh, and maternal mortality. And with that introduction, I will turn it over now to uh, Dr. Barfield uh, for today's Thank you so much, Dr. Mandel. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with everyone today. And I'm just going to first uh, share my uh, screen um, and we'll get started. So I, I hope that you're able to see the screen. And I just want to um, thank you for the opportunity to really talk with you about data modernization and equity in the field of maternal and infant health. And really the question is, are we there yet? So before we dive into modernization and equity, I just wanna share first a story. So I'm a neonatologist and I work in a neonatal intensive care unit and we get um, a request to run down to the emergency room to care for a baby that just delivered at 26 weeks. We ask, you know, what is the information on this baby? And the baby is delivered. We need to resuscitate the baby and bring the baby back to the intensive care unit. And what we learn is that from other providers that mom has no prenatal care, there's really very little information, but we're really trying to better understand the risk. So, the baby is being cared for and is very critically ill, born far too early. But as we have a conversation with the mother, what we learn is that the implications of her um, not having prenatal care often sends a signal that may not necessarily be accurate. And after talking with her and finding out more information, we really learned that she was a mother who had two other healthy babies who were born at full, full term. She um, didn't use any substances. She didn't use um, any 
um, interventions that has caused this preterm delivery and she was otherwise healthy. Um, but this woman who is an African-American woman, there were some assumptions based on why she showed up to the emergency room. But when we asked her more questions, what we learned was that she was homeless and due to some circumstances, wasn't able to have a home and was living in a shelter. And in that shelter, she had two toddler children and was really trying to figure out what she needed to do to care for them. And then this morning, she had abdominal pain and cramping and was really concerned about the health of her baby. However, because she was in a shelter, she felt like she couldn't one, leave her children to go to the hospital and show up in the emergency room. So she waited and waited and waited until a trusted friend could come and watch her children when she went to the emergency room. And lo and behold, she then delivered in the main area of the emergency room, getting there just minutes before the baby was born. So the reason why I share the story is because there are a lot of clinical scenarios and circumstances in which we can't get the whole story. And in our attempt of data modernization, we really have to think about where are the opportunities for us to incorporate the whole story in our collecting data and information. Because when we're short, we may get it wrong and we may make incorrect assumptions. So before we begin to talk about uh, the issue of data modernization, I wanna just give you some more background information. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide. So before we go into further information, I just want to share some data, okay? So we have made some progress over the last several decades, but there's still a lot to do in maternal and infant health. We know that each year about 700 women die of pregnancy-related causes. We know that about 50,000 women in the U.S. have severe pregnancy complications, that one in 10 infants are born in, prematurely, and that calculates about 380,000 babies, and that about 3,400 infants are lost to sudden unexpected infant death. And in addition to that, we know that there are these very unacceptable disparities in outcomes. We know that there are disparities in maternal mortality, that American Indian, Alaska Native, and Black women are two to three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women. We know that Black women insured by Medicaid are 1.7 times as likely to experience severe maternal morbidity than white women insured by Medicaid. And we also know that preterm birth rates are 30 to 50% higher among American Indian and Alaska Native, Black Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander infants compared to white, Hispanic, and Asian infants. And among sudden unexpected infant death rates, that they are two to 10 times higher amongst American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander infants than white, Hispanic, or Asian infants. So CDC's Division of Reproductive Health really monitors maternal and infant mortality and um, talks about the most serious reproductive health outcomes. And through this, we have data on several areas, and that includes the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, which measures experiences of women with a recent life birth, the um, National ART Surveillance System, which collects data on assisted reproductive technology, and the Pregnancy Mortality Surveillance System, which provides a national snapshot on pregnancy-related deaths. CDC also supports the Sudden Unexpected Infant Death, or SUID as we know it, and the Sudden Death in Young Registry, which helps to improve population-based SUID and SDI, SDY surveillance. And finally, I'd like to note a system called MARIA, 
which is a CDC data system that provides a common language for maternal mortality review committees and facilitates their functions and promotes a national approach to collecting data to identify opportunities to prevent maternal mortality. So I'll talk a little bit more about how MMRCs use MARIA later in this presentation. Now these surveillance systems contribute to the data that we use to identify problems and assess effectiveness in programs and policies. So while we continue to build the foundation on maternal and child data, we need to think about both modernization as well as data equity. And as we face these increasingly complex public health challenges, we need to create modern, integrated, real-time public health data and surveillance. And here you see some of the key strategies of CDC's data modernization initiative. And we need to move from reaction to predicting and from counting to understanding, and also from our siloed systems to accessible data for action. And we need to build stronger systems for more rapid, detailed, and actionable data and optimize the data sharing so that it can be accessible to states as well as communities to use that data for change. And data modernization isn't just about the technology, it's really about putting the right people, the processes and the policies in place. And we need to bring it all of the expertise, including many of you to the table from biostats and epidemiology to policy, implementation science and more. And we really need to work together to create healthier futures. So as we modernize data collection and surveillance, we need to keep data equity in focus. So more detailed, robust and connected data is essential. But we also have to acknowledge that data is influenced by the people and the structures that collect it, that analyze it and that report on it. And bias at any stage of the data cycle can cause inaccurate assumptions and harm public health programs. So in terms of thinking about core data elements, we should always think about how we can collect data on race, ethnicity, language spoken at home, age, sex, and geographic region. But other demographic elements may include data on sexual orientation and gender identity, people experiencing homelessness, people who are justice involved, and other population groups that have experienced social marginalization. Now, the construction of data collection and systems that impact analytic considerations for how race and ethnic categories are constructed and how those measures of health and equity and disparities are calculated and reported. Remember, that race and ethnicity are social constructs, not biological determinants. Race and ethnicity reflect the social and environmental conditions that impact most aspects of daily life experiences, and also that may result in profound differences in the distribution of risks and opportunities in our society. So collecting accurate and complete race and ethnicity data is important to elucidate these health disparities and equities. Uh, data collection and data analysis um, inform our interpretation. So when communicating data related to health disparities, it's important to use non-stigmatizing language to also discuss the historical and contextual reasons for health inequities and also highlight public health strategies to eliminate them. At CDC, we're working to integrate equity and diversity at every level of the data collection process and translating that data into equitable quality improvement. And we're also working to make maternal and child health data timely, accurate, and accessible. And I'll share more about how this works in our maternal mortality prevention uh, initiative. So here is just an example. We're working to improve data collection so that we better understand what causes maternal deaths and which um, this will actually help us to inform more effective interventions. So maternal mortality review committees 
or as we call them MMRCs, get the most detailed, complete data on a maternal death, including information about social determinants of health. And by doing this, they're bringing together representatives from public health, obstetrics and gynecology, maternal fetal medicine, nursing, midwifery, forensic pathology, social work, mental health, behavioral health, but also members of the community. And there is a conscious effort to ensure that there is diversity on the committee and that CDC provides training to the committees to ensure that everyone at the table has an equal voice. And these diverse multidisciplinary committees review death certificates and any linked birth and fetal death certificate data, as well as medical record data, social service records, mental health records, autopsies, and in some cases, informant interviews. And the conclusions aren't just about an infection or a specific medical condition, but it's also about where are the missed opportunities where we can understand the social determinants of health that influence the person's life and death. Now, this level of review helps us to understand both the medical and non-medical contributors to death, which then informs the development and prioritization of recommendations that may reduce future deaths. And the MMRC process provides prioritized recommendations that can then drive strategies to prevent maternal mortality. And in partnership with clinical and public health and community leadership and organizations, the recommendations from MMRC reviews can inform strategies to prevent maternal mortality within a state's context. So new data from the maternal mortality review committees um, found that there was a distribution in relation to pregnancy. And here we see that although 22% of maternal deaths occurred during pregnancy, when we're thinking about pregnancy-related death, the majority occur during delivery, and up to one week after, and then one week to one year actually after pregnancy. And this is an important thing to note because in terms of thinking about data, we really have to think about information that is beyond the clinical uh, and hospital encounter. Also, this slide talks a bit about the leading causes of pregnancy-related death. And this is, again, deaths that occur within one week to a year um, after pregnancy, during pregnancy, within uh, delivery, and up to a year after pregnancy. And from this data here, we can see that more than 80% of pregnancy-related deaths were preventable. So mental health conditions, hemorrhage, cardiac and coronary conditions, infection, thrombolic embolism and cardiomyopathy accounted for over 75% of pregnancy-related deaths. Now, this data is the most detailed picture we have on pregnancy-related deaths in the U.S., and it's essential for guiding efforts to truly improve the outcomes of mothers. And this data was recently released to include analysis of maternal mortality review committee data from 36 states that included over 1,000 pregnancy-related deaths that occurred between 2017 and 19. Now, this data reflects improvements in timeliness, consistency, and completeness of aggregated maternal mortality review committee data. And CDC also partnered with states through a system called Enhancing Reviews and Surveillance to Eliminate Maternal Mortality, or Erase MM. And we had detail from multiple sources. So we can see here that mental health conditions were a leading cause of pregnancy-related deaths. And also, again, without reviewing these deaths out to one year, most cardiomyopathy deaths would be missed. And these deaths, cardiomyopathy, are due to a weakened heart that may be a cause of death in the late postpartum period. However, it's really important for us to note the leading causes of death um, vary by race and ethnicity. So here's some information on the MMRC data by causes related by race. So you can see here that on the left, 
the leading causes of death for black women are different than the leading causes for non-Hispanic white women. And in fact, the leading cause for every race and ethnicity are different. So here, the leading causes of maternal death for black women are cardiac and coronary conditions followed by cardiomyopathy. And the leading causes for white women are mental health conditions and hemorrhage. And this is really important in order for us to identify the needs of populations and also the strategies that are needed in order to, uh, to address these disparities. So we really need to look at detailed data and then prioritize interventions accordingly. And it's important to consider these differences when we're trying to address equitable efforts to reduce maternal mortality. So as noted earlier, MMRCs have access to maternal mortality review information application or what we affectionately call MARIA. And this data system provides a common language across all MMRCs. And it's just one example of how important it is to align data modernization efforts with public health work that we do. And Maria facilitates documentation of a wide range of data on the life and death of a woman in order to ensure that review committees develop strong prevention recommendations. And over time, we've added components to Maria based on feedback from state users that have facilitated enhanced collection on things like maternal substance use, and social determinants of health. So CDC is also encouraging MMRCs to ensure that there is a diversity on committees and that everyone has a voice. So more recently, maternal mortality review committees have also begun to document the impacts of discrimination and racism. And there's growing recognition that discrimination, including interpersonal and structural racism, contributes to adverse maternal health outcomes. And as we have heard from MMRCs, that biases and discrimination play important roles in contributing to the factors that lead to death. So a work group of MMRC members and subject matter experts came together here to understand and capture bias as a potential factor in maternal mortality review. And the work accumulated in addition to uh, factors such as discrimination, interpersonal racism, and structural racism as data fields that are available in Maria. So in addition to working towards standardizing definitions and processes, we're also working with um, the National Association of Public Health Statisticians and Information Systems to leverage the information systems that states already are using to identify pregnancy-associated deaths more quickly, so that this will allow states to have more rapid access to data while saving time and resources. And we're working to integrate even more data sources like informant interviews and indicators and dashboards that will offer what's considered like a community vital signs and understanding the community context for the risk of death. So with these investments from data modernization, we've been piloting real-time transfer and linkage of vital records to CDC from states in order to improve the timeliness and completeness of identification of these deaths while also reducing the state level data entry burden, saving up to about 40 hours a year per average per jurisdiction. And we're expanding this to all states to speed up the review. So one example is in Washington, and this is how it's been implemented. So Washington State's Department of Health trained their MMRCs to identify words, phrases, and situations that provide evidence of discrimination in deaths that involve substance use disorder. And MARIA tools are used to document evidence of discrimination, such as um, these examples. So for example, symptoms that don't attribute to substance use that do not correspond to recognized symptoms of substance use or withdrawal, or in the chart, drug use is repeatedly mentioned, or that there are multiple emergency department, urgent care, or primary care provider visits for a similar complaint in a short period of time. 
So more data that we, the more data we pull together, the more we can see the full story. And some states, for example, Illinois, are using case examples as part of their maternal mortality and morbidity reports to bring the data to life and highlight major themes and factors that need to be addressed in preventing pregnancy-related deaths. And it helps to remind us of these lives that are affected through each data point. Now, the work that's being done to tell the stories of life loss through infant and maternal mortality review is a key in order to transform that data to action and drive the necessary change for outcome improvements. We're also reimagining PRAMS, which is um, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. And PRAMS collects site-specific population data on maternal attitudes and experiences before, during, and shortly after a recent live birth. PRAMS is innovated in the ways that it supplements modules that can be added to the IT data collection system to gather data on emerging topics such as prescription opioid use during pregnancy, experiences during the COVID pandemic, and COVID-19 vaccination. And the system is currently in the process of updating the survey content for a new phase based on broad responses for the field to ensure that these questions and topics are relevant and continue to address emerging priorities in maternal and child health. Now, questions that are being added to phase nine include things like social determinants of health, racism and discrimination, housing stability, access to transportation, incarceration, food security, employment, and more. And PRAMS is also piloting a web module of data um, collection that complements the current mail and telephone data collection modes. And this pilot has been found to increase response rates and also reduce some of the burden in terms of data entry. So using advanced statistical methods, PRAMS is also exploring small area analysis to provide data at the county level. And this may help improve the understanding of geographic disparities, help identify critical and emerging health programs, and guide jurisdiction program and decision-making. And PRAMS is also working with states to link self-reported survey data with clinical outcomes such as hospital discharge and Medicaid claims data to provide a richer context of data sets for patient-centered research. And these modernization efforts inform rich analyses to answer the right questions at the right time. So in terms of data modernization and health equity, are we there yet? Well, there's still a lot that we need to do, but we are moving in the right direction. And so what I'd like to do is think about the broader goals of data modernization and health equity. So for data modernization, it's really bridging the gap between the data we have now and the data that we need to fully understand and address the drivers of health equity. Um, of health disparities. And at CDC, we're taking action toward equitable public health by making data more complete, higher quality, more accessible, and more representative of the, the people. So how does data modernization support health equity? Well, a first step towards equity is improving the data that we have available. And this includes improving how we consolidate, link, and use equity-related data. We need to use new tools and approaches to reduce and account for biases in public health data and analytics, as well as improving our understanding of social determinants of health. We also need to understand the impacts of social and demographic factors on health by linking data in new ways. And this data needs to be open and accessible to the public. Finally, we need to build a highly skilled, diverse workforce because the people and skills at the table really matter. So for more information on data modernization and equity, I encourage you to review the recommendations from the National Commission to Transform Public Health Systems and CDC's website on data modernization initiative and health equity.
Thank you very much. So at this time, I'd like to open things up for questions, and I know there may be questions in the chat. Thank you, Wanda. Um, that was terrific. Um, it's really um, inspiring to see the multifaceted approach that you're taking to collecting data in the um, around maternal and um, perinatal health. Do you, of, of these different approaches that are, you know, modernizing the past, you, you contrasted them with existing approaches like mail and telephone, um, which it, can you comment on, first of all, on just whether those traditional approaches are yielding any fruit in the current era or whether those are uh, approaches that you think will be uh, deprecated? Yes, so so thank you, Ken, for, for your question. So part of the challenge in terms of thinking about newer systems and newer approaches for data collection is, are we allowing everyone to accelerate with us? So we know, for example, that typically, um, data collection that may involve the internet may actually leave behind certain populations who are suffering from the internet divide. And, and there have actually been several maternal health surveys that haven't been successful in their participation rate um, because they were internet-based. And so we really have to think about ways that one, our populations feel most comfortable telling the story and then um, making sure that they're also at the table. So I, I think that's a really important point. I mean, one example, for example, we do have to think about maybe male being a less um, robust opportunity as our, our male systems change. But even for example, in disasters, Puerto Rico had, you know, um, during Hurricane Maria, a huge loss in terms of their mailing system infrastructure. So using actually um, portable um, computers and um, palm devices was an efficient way to ask questions. That makes sense. Um, so, and does, uh, does text um, fall into that? Um, Texting, like uh, the there was the um, text for baby campaign, was an extremely successful way to reach new mothers a number of years ago. Um, is that one of the modalities you're using? So that is another opportunity, and um, part of the challenge is also making sure that in asking mothers about certain data that we're not creating undue costs, right? So how can we? think about ways to obtain data without it, for example, costing them in terms of their, their text time. Yes. Let me um, go now to a few of the uh, questions, some really interesting ones that are showing up here. Here's one. Are there data on outcome disparities within a racial group by socioeconomic status or affluence level? For example, within the black population, what are the rates of complications for the least versus the most affluent quartiles? And how do these compare to the least versus most affluent quartiles within the white population? Trying to hone in on the specific effects of institutional racism independent of economic status. Yes, yeah, so that's a, a great question. There hasn't been as much done on the maternal side, but there has been quite a bit of work done on the infant side. And I would point to um, the work of Jimmy Collins and other colleagues that have looked at data based on, on census and looked at specific income. And despite income and many of the data sets that CDC has looked at include maternal education. So we know that women with a high education still have an uh, fivefold increased risk of maternal death compared to women with less than high school or high school education. So despite education 
and despite income. And, and your point is also well taken in terms of trying to allude to wealth, right? So despite wealth, Black women are still at increased risk for adverse pregnancy-related complications. Great, great question, great answer. Um, here's one from uh, Rick Goldstein. Um, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Can you comment on variability in reporting and how physician biases may influence the quality of the data reported? So yes, thank you, Dr. Goldstein. There, there are concerns about variability in reporting. And so again, thinking about how we can create um, equitable standards in terms of reporting data is important. So for example, even in the reporting of race ethnicity, we're still facing potential biases. Um, for, for example, for Native American populations, if we pick a single race as the identifier, we may lose the richness of context in multiracial as well as those who may represent uh, Native American heritage um, and, and really lose the breadth of that, that context. So we do really need to be thoughtful about how we're collecting data and think also about how we can standard, standardize the collection of data. And that's what maternal mortality review committees are doing. Here's, a, here's another, this is about mental health conditions. Um, and by the way, if, if folks put their questions into the Q&A, uh, we can get to them. Uh, there's, there's a nice assortment now. Um, so uh, mental health conditions, are important in pregnancy-related death? This is the question. Um, uh, does your data uh, capture um, domestic violence uh, intersecting with mental health conditions? Yes, so to answer your question um, immediately, we are looking at um, mental health conditions as well as the role of domestic violence. And um, through colleagues also who are in the injury center, looking at some of those factors as well as um, looking at ACEs. I do think that it is important and the point of the talk in terms of the focus is that overall it appears that mental health condition is a leading cause, but in looking at causes by race, it's important to note that for, for black women, cardiovascular diseases and disorders are a leading cause. So in terms of thinking about interventions in communities, we really need to look at um, the burden of, of death and some of the causes so that we don't use, for example, a blanket remedy in terms of thinking about how we might address that. Great. Uh, here's a question about um, within hospitals and hospital departments, um, there's, uh, there's a concept of a health equity dashboard to sort of track these processes and outcomes and impacts. Um, and what do you think about them as a tool um, based, you know, does, does, does that, do you think, translate into something that is, uh, uh, I'm, now I'm riffing a little on the question, is that something that you think can be captured in a dashboard fashion in a way that's faithful to the, the meaning of those variables in the way that the in the way that uh, hospital leaders would hope to interpret them. So I guess it depends on what you're measuring, right? I mean, dashboards are kind of neat and nifty and you know may help us to understand our progress, but it depends on like what the content is, right? Um, is it you know, related to training or is it relating to hiring? I mean, I think thinking about what the content is is what's maybe more important than how it's how it's even displayed or monitored. And and often maybe it, it's challenging. It definitely is challenging, but how do we dig deep in some of these activities to make sure that we're really moving the needle? 
Great. So, Wanda, here's a, another question for you. So, obviously, there have been very important policy changes around reproductive health recently. And um, can I ask what impacts you believe you really need to start to measure mo more so, perhaps, than before? What, 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 where do you expect to see measurable changes over the next one to two years? So I think that in terms of thinking about changes, it will always remain important to listen to women and to listen to birthing people and their experiences. And how can we capture that information um, in a robust manner, no matter where they are? And then also thinking about the broader issue of uh, health access and access to care, which again um, has been a longstanding issue for certain populations. And we also want to make sure that we continue to do that more broadly, no matter what the changes are, right? I mean, this issue of disparities in maternal and infant health has been incredibly longstanding. And so we need to continue to monitor those areas and think about the disparities and what also additional issues may unfold. And I think also thinking about, you know, taking the long view in terms of how this not only in, impacts uh, birthing people, women of reproductive age, also infant health, child health in the long run is really also going to be very important. So, and in, in, in this era where, where we have changes in access to pregnancy related care, um, one might anticipate more babies being born. Um, within, you're a, neonat, you're a neonatologist, um, some babies who might not have been born because of certain problems that were detected prenatally might be born now. Are you, looking also for an increase in um, births of uh, babies that have um, uh, various um, genetic and other conditions and structural conditions that might that, 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 that could potentially surge in a new era. So I think that looking for changes in general reproductive outcomes from baseline is gonna be really important. And that may be one of the areas to look at, as well as um, whether there are changes in um, preterm deliveries or other types of deliveries that we aren't used to seeing. Um, but there may also be some counter information that may make it more complicated, I mean, one of the areas or opportunities that we've seen from the maternal mortality review committees is that they've made recommendations that women should be cared for beyond the you know, 60 days or six weeks in the pregnancy period. And now we're really starting to see that spiral in terms of Medicaid coverage in the postpartum period. So there may be a lot of, um, areas where we're seeing improvements and areas where we're seeing setbacks. Could you just um, give a little more uh, detail on the, on the Medicare and the Medicaid changes around? Uh, yes, so, so for those of you who aren't familiar with sort of the postpartum period, women who are receive Medicaid um, often um, lose that benefit approximately six weeks postpartum. And then they're not covered, yet they may still be subject to a variety of health conditions that I just presented in the slide, right? Mental health issues, hypertensive disorders, uh, diabetes, other medical conditions that may need ongoing care. And as a result of the work of the MMRCs and their recommendations, the recommendations are to continue to follow and care for women and provide uh, healthcare coverage up to a year postpartum. And so now we're seeing states throughout the country adopting that measure. 
And so now there may be opportunities to see uh, care continue beyond the immediate postpartum period. There's still a lot of work that we need to do in terms of that quality of care. And again, making sure that women are, are heard and are not subject to biases or areas that don't allow them to receive the care that they need. Great. So Wanda, this has been um, a, a really terrific talk. You know, there's, there's uh, you can't overemphasize the importance of measurement um, in uh, public health and in improving population health. And you've taken us through the challenges and also where we're seeing um, progress uh, in this area. And I would, um, you know, encourage folks to um, uh, get in touch with Dr. Barfield if, you know, if you're working in this area, you know, this is a, I, I can see who's on the Zoom, it's a, it's a good group. And um, I know there are people here uh, at Boston Children's who have more than a passing interest in uh, maternal and child health. So um, I will um, thank you uh, very, very uh, kindly for taking the time to um, uh, spend with us today. And um, uh, everyone can uh, clap uh, on, in your, <laughs> In your uh, webinar uh, uh, world, we'll know we'll know that it's actually happening. So thank you very much, uh, Wanda. Um, and I'm just going to point to a few upcoming talks within the series. We have um, coming up very soon, uh, December 5th, is Ray Kurzweil, one of the foremost futurists of the of of this of of his generation. Um, Rich Miner, uh, early in 2023, who invented the Android operating system, Alan Brandt, um, a, uh, a spectacular uh, um, professor of the history of medicine, Ron Balliser, who um, brought uh, to you much of the research out of Israel on uh, COVID vaccination using real world data in the Cloud Lead Health Services, Julie Gerberding, former CDC director, um, and now Chief Executive Officer at the National Institutes of Health, uh, the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Karen Copenhaver, who's um, uh, the uh, uh, um, internet and commerce lawyer um, for um, example for Linux and has um, really cutting edge understanding of how to use open source. Um, Robert Langer, who is one of the most, um, uh, uh, I think the most, the, the engineer with the most patents and perhaps the most sites um, in uh, history. Ian Lipkin, a virus hunter at Columbia and Tom Mayer, who's the medical director for the NFL. It's actually the NFL Players Association. Um, and he um, has brought uh, forth spectacular changes in, and improvements in safety for the players over the last um, seven or eight years. So good um, group coming up. Stay, uh, you, you know where to uh, find us because you found us for this one. And you know we're also uh, keep come get in touch with us here at the uh, Computational Health Informatics Program uh, where we're uh, often recruiting for faculty, always recruiting for students and postdocs. And thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, spending time with us this afternoon.